I V M. Hello and welcome. This is Govind Raj Jethi Raj presenting to you the latest segment of Business Dot Next on Bloomberg Quint. We are in conversation with Harry Paul, the co-author of Fish, an interesting book about Pike Place in Seattle, Washington, in the United States, where which is also now in some ways the fountainhead of a management story on how to run organizations in a fun and exciting way. Harry, thank you very much for being with us. My pleasure. So the question here that we are posing now is: We've understood to some extent what is a culture of excellence. How do you identify one, and which are the companies that have a strong culture of excellence, and what brings it together? Which is, of course, vision, mission, and direction. Without and without this, you cannot build a culture. And and presumably, if you don't have the culture, then these three points or these three pillars will not stand up. So now the question is: How do you actually create a culture of excellence, particularly in an organization which is already existing and running and separately we could talk about how do you create a culture of excellence in an organization that is starting out and there are many of those in india as well okay first as i said earlier if you're not moving towards excellence you're moving towards average and when you're looking at a culture of excellence you have to look within first because if company or a person is having trouble with their culture or adapting their culture or enhancing their culture usually it's comes from within it's, it's stare in the mirror because that's where the the challenge is happening so you have to look within also when you're measuring your excellence measure against uh, your excellence not a competitors not yourself it's very important to understand that you have to be the best that you can be and then know that when you are in a race this is a race you're moving towards excellence there's no second place because what is second place if you're moving towards excellence average a place you don't want to be and that we've identified five characteristics of a culture of excellence and all five must be present in that culture because if you miss on one you are moving away from excellence towards average and those five parts of a culture of excellence are everyone has to have passion for what they do they have to understand the importance of what they were doing and the difference it makes it's really understanding that product behind the product and having that zest for life to want to make a difference because if you don't have passion I think you have indifference and you're going to wallow in the sludge of negativity. Working with companies in India have I as I've done in the past, I've noticed that passion that they've had for what they were doing when I was working with Agrotech or Maruti Suzuki or Nascom or Brendix in um uh Sri Lanka. They all had that passion for what they were doing and understood how important it is. So that's the first pillar. The second is competency. They had ongoing learning all the time. And competency, very important to remember, is just not about the technical skills. It's about the interpersonal skills because an organization is a living, breathing entity made up of people. So we have to get along with each other. We have to support each other. If you don't have if you're not growing constantly you start to become incompetent and uh Ray Kroc who is was the founder of McDonald's another organization that understood the value of the fish philosophy he said you're either green and growing or ripe and rotting and that's a, a that's kind of a something personally that I took to heart because Uh, I've always went to I I've always strived to learn. So that competency is the second point. The third is communication, very important. And communication is made up of two parts, speaking and listening. And the thing we don't do enough of is we don't listen. We should listen more than we should uh be speaking, I believe. Uh, uh Stephen Covey, the the um personal development and business guru said uh, uh, uh he says seek first to understand before being understood that's all about listening 
and to make things clear. And, and remember one thing, a lot of times when people move up the pyramid of management, they hold on to information. Information is not a weapon. Information is meant to share. Share as much of it as possible so people have everything they need to be the best that they can be. The fourth pillar is flexibility. Flexibility is having a plan. We all need plans. But when it's not working, change the plan. That's how you sustain success. Because if you're not flexible, you're inflexible. Have that plan, but be prepared to change when the circumstances dictate. And the fifth pillar is ownership, responsibility. Take ownership for your actions. If you see something that's not right, own it and fix it, whether it's your job or not. You're part of the company. You're, the, you're part of the window to the world of that company. Take responsibility. Take action. So when you look at those five points, when you're, you know, you look from within about what you can do in an organization, you have that passion, you have that zest for life, not wallowing in the sludge. You have the competency, the communication, you don't obfuscate, the flexibility and, and have the wherewithal to change, which goes back to competency when you think about it, and taking responsibility. So if you eliminate any one of those, any one of those, you are moving away from excellence and moving towards average. That's why I say all five must be present. That's how you start a culture of excellence in an organization, and that's how you write uh, the ship uh, of a culture in an organization. So whether it's a new organization looking to develop the culture and or a, an older one, uh, an established firm, those are the five pillars. And remember, none of us is as smart as all of us. We all need to be part of the creation and the sustainability of a, uh, a culture. Any examples that come to mind about companies that in, have achieved a sort of a smart beginning late in the day? I, I think one of them would be Apple. Think about the history of Apple. It started out where they brought the personal computer to the world, and then they almost went out of business because they lost their focus they drove out the person who had the most, the clearest vision, and then they bring him back and they become the most valuable company in the world. And you look at that and it, was it culture or was it Steve Jobs? Was it his vision? I think when you look at it and peel the layers away, there was a passion to innovate, a passion to create the best products in the world. And to do that, they needed to communicate well with each other. They needed that flexibility, the ownership, uh, the competency to constantly grow. So a company that started out great, went into that valley, and then came back up to the peak, I think that's a good example uh, on, on two fronts. One is you really got to pay attention. And the second is it's never too late because I, I, I remember this very clearly. That company was very close to going out of business. And now, let's face it, we, we all love our iPhones and iPads and <laughs> everything else. I, I know I do. So that also seems to suggest that the only way this can be done is if uh, you have a really, I don't know if flamboyant is the right word, but a very dynamic CEO who you know comes in with a lot of force and then takes the whole organization along, drills these principles down, is, is that the only way it would happen? No, I, 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 I think that's one way. I, but the fish market, now, I, I, you know, that's a culture of excellence, and no one knows who that owner is. I, I know the, the, the owner. He was so low-key. He was the man behind his employees, pushing them, encouraging them to create their own culture. So it doesn't have to be that flamboyant person. When you look at the Fortune uh, 500 companies or the top, let's say, 100 companies in the world, you might know uh, who the head of Apple is or the head of Google or the head of Amazon. But there's a lot of companies you don't know who the CEO is, yet they're successful organizations. So 
I don't think it's necessary. I think it does help. Uh, sometimes it can hurt. You look at uh, uh, Tesla, Elon Musk, very flamboyant, but sometimes his flamboyancy hurts as much as it does help. So I, I think it's just that organic organization that they create that's made up of the people that's more important than just the CEO. Right. And how how does uh, how does it work for a manager? So let's say if I'm a manager and maybe a senior one at that, I'm, I'm not sure if my CEO is in the mood to create fun in the organization. And I even maybe think that the vision or mission or direction and uh, the communication, the competency, everything is, uh, is, is not top of the line. W- what can I do? You know, I get asked that question a lot. And I think it's very valid. And it's, it's a, a very difficult situation to be in. And I just got an email uh, two days ago asking that same exact question. My thought is and my advice is be such a good example of living in a culture of excellence, creating your own culture of excellence that they take notice and say, hey, something's happening here. We got to do things differently. To use the fish market as an example, they were almost out of business. They weren't doing well. Then one of the uh, newer, younger fishmongers said, we got to do something different, uh, differently or we're not going to have a job. And they say, well, like what? And he goes, why don't we act differently? Why don't we act like we're world famous? And they didn't know what that was, but they just started to act differently. And things started to change and business started to change. And the owner, Johnny, took notice and said, hey, wait a minute. I better get better get on board because he was that CEO you're talking about. He was your boss that you were talking about. And he was smart enough to step back and say something's happening here. And to give you an example, what used to be two weeks of good revenue before they created their culture of excellence in the fish philosophy is now considered a bad morning in the amount of revenue. Two weeks of good revenue is now, back then, is now considered the amount of bad morning. So wise people will step back and hopefully get their ego out of the way. Great question. Right. The nature of work and workplaces is changing uh, for a couple of reasons. One is we've had, even since you've written the book, we've had a very, very accelerated phase of globalization, which has seen companies spread, grow, and in some ways we're seeing a retreat of of the same thing. On the other hand, you have artificial intelligence and machine learning and robotics, which is also bringing about a lot, a lot of changes and cutting jobs uh, or replacing them. Uh, and the third is that people, thanks to good connectivity, are also choosing to work differently. They work from homes, they work on flexible times and so on, and, it, and it, it's fine. All of this, uh, is this, is this... Is this detrimental to efforts, to the efforts of a corporation or a CEO to build a unified culture of excellence, or can it, can this, can those, can that effort even work in the sort of new work environment that we are in today? You know, I think if you asked me this question twenty years ago, I would have said, "No, you need to be coming. You need to come into the workplace to have that culture." Nowadays, that's just not so, and. How do you bring the high touch into high tech? How do you bring people who, uh, what do they call it, telecommuting? How do you bring them into uh, a virtual organization? Because that's what you're talking about, a virtual organization. And I think it becomes more important than ever that you create that culture of excellence. Because whether you work in an organization physically or you telecommute or you're, you're, you're located uh, halfway around the world and working alone from home for this organization, you still need those five pillars, don't you? You still need that passion for what you're doing and an understanding of how important it is. You still need to grow your skills and communicate, even more importantly, to communicate well. And the other, uh, uh, flexibility and taking responsibility. Flexibility, hey, I'm, I'm away, but how do I make things uh, how do I draw myself closer to people? How do I draw them closer to me? And, and, and taking responsibility for that. So you can see how important those five pillars become in that virtual work world that we all live in. Uh, I mean, there's 
very few people that don't, uh, and it's going to continue to grow. And you, you said it so eloquently, what the world's going to be, what the world looks like um, in, in business today. Right. Uh, uh, we're running to the end of our final segment as well. As you look ahead uh, in uh, 2019 and 20, what are the new trends that you see emerging in corporations in the way they compete or hyper compete, the role of technology and how business leaders should be staying abreast of the changes and anticipating change? I think the biggest mistake companies could make uh, today is not uh, investing in their people uh, to think that they are expendable, to think that they're just a a number on some kind of uh, uh, spreadsheet somewhere, that these people in a high tech world, you need those people to bring in the high touch. So I would say invest in your people, because they're the ones that are going to continue to help grow and to come up with new ideas. Uh, Starbucks, one of their most successful drinks is a, uh, a Frappuccino. It was created by a barista in a Starbucks somewhere, and now it's one of their big sellers. Your people are going to come up with the ideas. You need that creativity. Uh, support them. All, and remember one thing, if I could leave a phrase with people, what are your people? You want them not to check their brains at the door. You want them to come in and share ideas because that's how organizations grow. So invest in your people. Right. So last question, Harry. So do you visit Pike Place free frequently or even now? And uh, what is the last thing that you saw and liked about the place? I was there a few months ago. I go there at least two times a year. The thing that I that struck me was Johnny, the owner, decided to retire and his legacy and the fish market culture and what they do was so important. He sold the organization to three of the fishmongers and helped finance the sale himself because it was that important for him to continue that legacy and to make a difference in people's lives. I think that's pretty special myself. Right, and that's a wonderful and warm note to end on. Harry, thank you very much for speaking with us. My pleasure. Don't forget to tune in on BloombergQuint.com or IBM podcast app for the latest edition of Business.Next podcast every week. Did you know that Parsis in Mumbai, instead of being left at the Tower of Silence after they die, are now cremated? And why? Because a cow fell sick in the early 1990s. Did you know that the smog in Delhi is caused by something that farmers in Punjab do and that there's no way to stop them? Did you know that there wasn't one gas tragedy in Bhopal, but three? One of them was seen, but two were unseen. Did you know that many well-intentioned government policies hurt the people they're supposed to help? Why was demonetization a bad idea? How should GST have been implemented? Why are all our politicians so corrupt when not all of them are bad people? I'm Amit Varma, and in my weekly podcast, The Seen and the Unseen, I take a shot at answering all these questions and many more. I aim to go beyond the scene and show you the unseen effects of public policy and private action. I speak to experts on economics, political philosophy, cognitive neuroscience, and constitutional law so that the insights can blow not only my mind, but also yours. The Seen and the Unseen releases every Monday. So do check out the archives and follow the show at seenunseen.in. You can also subscribe to The Seen and the Unseen on whatever podcast app you happen to prefer. Do you wish you were smarter? Well, so do we. But the next best thing? We could make you sound smarter. And to help you with this endeavor, we are Simplified, Ooh. a podcast uh, that attempts to break down the complex world around you with a uh, little knowledge, a lot of poor jokes, and a ton of random trivia. Episodes out every Monday. On the IVM podcast app or wherever you get your podcasts. See ya! See ya.